All right, well, it always works out beautifully, Razor, when we get a chance to talk about a win, but especially a nice solid win, a nice solid win on opening night, a night that, uh, you know what? When you enjoy what you do like we do and you go there, first of all, it doesn't feel like we missed any time doing a game, at least to me. And second of all, it just felt good. It felt good to be home, literally and figuratively. As we welcome you in the Morning Brew with Jaffe and Razor, now proudly partnered with Nesson on the digital side, Nesson.com, where you can find us wherever you get all your podcasts. And uh, you can find us at Nesson.com as well. And uh, yes, Razor and I spent all the kibble that we had <laughs> to get those ads in game. All kidding aside, we've partnered with Ness and the good people <laughs> over there. And um, we're looking forward to a great relationship with them. So this is an episode one, but I, I be, because we've done a few preseason shows, but we'll call it game one, uh, you know, episode as the Bruins win three to one over the Dallas Stars. And, and, and Razor, it, it was kind of like, I think we said it in post-game best, the Bruins never let anything get to them. They had a real, it was business-like, methodical, I guess even-keeled approach all game. And I'll add Bruin-like. And despite all the new faces, despite the, the turnover this summer, it was a Bruin-like win for this team. And and. That's the the most positive thing for me out of it is that nothing really changed. Everybody fit in well. We talked about could these pieces all come together and and it's very small sample size, but in one game against a good Dallas team that makes you earn everything you get, they stuck with it throughout the game. Yeah, they sure did. Um, the, the, the real positives in my head, and this is in no particular order, um, it would probably help if I wrote stuff down like a real host would. So it was, it should be in the right order, but since I'm not, I'm, I'm going to say what the it's hell. It's no fun. It's no fun, right then. Um, but, uh, okay, obviously you get the, the Marchand goals, um, but the positives to me, they didn't have to rely on the top line. You know, they were good, but, you know, they weren't outstanding. They didn't have to rely mm -hmm. on the power play. That was another thing. They had a great mm -hmm. performance from their young netminder, from Swayman, who really came through. They got contributions from a few guys, whether it was a Charlie Coyle, whether it was a Jake DeBrusque, that you wondered about, right? What were they going to be like? Um, and then the other thing is I thought they got nice contributions from in the O-zone and D-zone, but O-zone from their D-men, as, you know, especially the right side. And we featured that in the post game on Nesson. Right side contributed, what was it, eight? I don't remember now. How many shots on goal? It was a lot of shots. It was the right side alone. Well, the D-man, the, the group itself had 19 shots, which is a Great. lot. For Half this the shots. Group. If you, yeah. you know, it, it would have taken four or five games for them to get 19 shots at, over some stretches last season. So um, certainly a, a big offensive output. And, and it wasn't on the scoreboard. It was just getting pucks to the net. If you're getting 19 shots from your defense, you're going to create a lot of opportunities throughout an entire season. So, and it went, by the way, it wasn't the typical guys that were accruing all the shots. You know, Carlo had a bunch. Riley, you know, we know Riley likes to shoot. He got some. Clifton was involved. So it was it was wonderful to see that. Let's start with this. Um, the vibe in general. For fans that weren't there, we have a lot of listeners that – aren't at the game because they live in Canada or in Europe or, you know, out of state or whatever. Um, I thought the vibe was, I, I thought it was appropriate. It wasn't manufactured at all, despite the fact it was the first game back. And I know we had fans in the stands at the end of last year. I, I get that, but this is a different, like, at least to me, it felt different. Like it's, it's a rebirth of sorts, an 82 game season in theory. Right. Um, a normal hockey year in theory again. So the Bruins had nice intros, but nothing over the top. The fans were happy to be there, excited to be there. But uh, it, to me, at least, Razor, it was a very different feel than when the first game where they allowed 17,000 in, you know, during the regular season last year. Remember that game? That was like a, that wasn't like, that was a, 
the, the, the just the freaking party. I mean, that's what that was for <laughs> obvious for obvious reasons. So I, I, the vibe to me was appropriate, and the fans appreciated it and they respected it. That was my take. What was yours? It was the season ticket holders were all back. The normal crowd was all back. Everybody signed up for their season tickets again, rather than deferring or not knowing what they were going to do with them. And they wanted the 82 game season. So it, yes, it felt like the the typical Boston crowd. There was still quite a few beer chugs on the, oh. on the jumbotron, but that's a typical Saturday night special at, at the garden. So uh, I agree. It was a happy crowd, happy and it felt like everyone that was there was um, in there, it, like you said, their happy place. Yeah, and it was good. It was just, um, it was just right. It was great to see everybody. And again, we saw these people at the end of last regular season, but it's just different. yeah, it was. It was. It's people that usually go to Bruins games. I, I think in the playoffs, it was anybody who could get their hands on the ticket. We're going to try and get a ticket just to get out of the house and, and mm -hmm. say that they had done something new. Where this was the the Bruins fans, the people with the jerseys, the people that are going to be at thirty of out of forty of these games. Yeah, and what a good day for Boston sports! Another mm. one of those days where I don't, I don't want to say we take it for granted being Boston sports people because I can't speak for you. I can't speak for others. I, I definitely sure take that. it for granted. Definitely well, take it for granted. Well, it, you take it for granted, but but don't you? I don't know. Don't you have those moments where you're just like, I mean, I, look, I grew up in Chicago. I grew up a diehard Bruins fan. Bruins, Red Sox, Patriots, and even Celtics. In the day of Bird and, you know, those, and Robert Parrish, Kevin McHale, DJ, I, I love those because my family, my maternal side from Boston, I grew up legit, but, but I grew up in Chicago. So I saw a lot of shit. I saw a lot of shit sports. I did. I, I, I mean, you know, all you got to do is say Cubs, and you know what I mean. Uh, yeah. Uh, but so, like, these are the, these are the days where you know. I know it's just two pro games, but I mean, I was doing youth hockey in the morning, a high, you know, intense Eagles series that they're involved in, and it was phenomenal. And like, we get it in this town, and then the Bruins or then the Red Sox win, and the Bruins win. Just another fun day. Uh, speaking of fun, does anybody have more fun than Marshy, than Brad Marsh with this team? And uh, the leadership qualities in him continue to grow. In this game, uh, you know, I, he just he he scored when he was given those opportunities. I, I mean, let's rifle through this game. Is you know, the Bruins come out with a beautiful start in the sense of they did not hesitate getting pucks deep to get the, the Dallas Demon, which are the strength of that team, to turn and to have to chase pucks side to side, you know, literally changing the point of attack. The Bruins get that going. They get a turnover eventually. Marshy gets a shorthanded break, or I'm sorry, a breakaway, and uh, then he gets a penalty shot call because he gets cross-checked from behind, blatant cross-check by Ryan Suter. Going to the mind of the goaltender, Holtby, right there. What are you thinking when when Marshan nestles up to that center ice spot to get the puck? Uh, well, and then he he comes to speed first of all. That's your first as a goalie. That's your first read is what kind of speed is he coming in at? And and, and Marsha came in pretty hot. So right away, then you're thinking, all right, shot. But with Brad, he still has that ability where he came in on the angle to come in and and go backhand. Uh, be able to still deke. Holpe uh, seemed to cheat that way a little bit. And, and it did look like on the replay from down low that Marshawn changed, and he said it as much, but you can see him change his thought process once he realizes that that low blocker opens up because Holpe's a little bit on the body, not necessarily lined up directly on the puck and, and expecting Brad to, to make a move rather than just come in and shoot. Um, whether he was covering five hole a little bit, whether he's covering to that glove side. So uh, Brad recognized that and, and, and shot right away, a quick shot, low blocker, which, which is a tough play, um, but it could have been made a little bit easier from the Holpe point of view had he been over an inch and a half to his right side. If Brad had put his head down, if he had looked at the puck a little bit, as an NHL goaltender, would that give away for to you that he's making a deke there or some move before he's going to shoot? I think it, it would, but you got you got to take me to the NHL crease to tell me that's it. No, it does. It does that. And also, listen, like Brad talked about making an adjustment on the way in. 
I think Holpe, guys have books on guys. They watch mm -hmm. different angles and, and routes, and goalies are intuitive in that way. And the, the guys who can't make an adjustment or don't have their body position set up to make an adjustment are the ones that get stopped more often than not. And, and, and Brad's ability to adjust and do something that he wasn't planning on doing on the way in in a split second is, is what makes him great. So an appropriate first star of the game for Brad as he has two goals, plus two in the game, five shots on goal. He had a giveaway or two, and he also had a takeaway. But then they, that's just going to happen when you own the puck as much as he does. Yeah. But he plays 20 minutes and four seconds, uh, leading the way up front for, for, for all Bruins forwards. Um, part of a, 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 a big-time part of the penalty kill that was six for six. Yes, Dallas got 11 shots, but you're talking six power plays, about nine or 10 minutes of power play time eventually there. Yeah, and I would suggest those, there's probably four or five of those shots were in the six on four period of it when they're up two goals. The, mm -hmm. They didn't get many shots uh, in the first and second periods on those power plays. Yeah. So he, he you know, Marshy does what he does. I mean, yeah. he starts, he picks off where he left off. Um, I've got him pegged in an 82 game season for 100 points. I do. I've got him pegged for 100 points this year. Um, I think he's on pace for 164 right now. So, right. <clears throat> so we're close. He's he, <laughs> he should be okay. Yeah. Um, you know the the other good news. I mean, the good news is that they didn't rely on these guys. You know, Bergeron had what I would call a quiet game. You know, he makes some nice plays and all, but but definitely quiet. He did have. A shot on goal. He had a couple of hits, but I didn't really notice him overall. Pasternak, I noticed a couple of times. How about you? Like, I mean, he missed the net early on, right? And then he got stoned a couple of times too. Overall, David had eight, uh, I beg your pardon, nine total shot attempts, four that hit the net. But the two, the three missed shots. I mean, I know it's an easy game when you're from afar. And, and I, re I get reminded all every time when I go on the ice how hard it actually is. But if you're going to be that guy, you know, you, you know those. Some you could see the frustration in his head too. You could when he would look to the rafters above when he missed. But he had three golden chances and he missed all three of them. I mean, gold. Yeah, and he, when he he doesn't have to be perfect. When you have a shot like that, you just don't have. You just get it on net. If you hit the net uh, more often than not, it goes in the net. He just doesn't have to be perfect. And, and you don't want him thinking that he's got to be perfect because that's when he ends up missing the net. So, uh, a little, got to re recalibrate the sight on that gun of his and, and just find a way to get it on net, get those opportunities on the, on that, especially on that left flank. Uh, yeah. he's got to pound it in. And again, what happens almost all the time when he misses the net as well is it goes right around the boards and goes exactly. out, clears exactly. the zone, and all the momentum that that line had been carrying goes right out the window. Yeah. And that's as frustrating as anything. You know, you, you compare him to the other great one-timers in the league, the, the Stamkoses, uh, Ovechkin, obviously, Kucherov from the other side. He's a lefty, but great one-timer. I, I think we need to do a little deep dive into this and look on the average how many missed shots those guys have compared to. It just feels like David has had more missed shots than than the others. Um, and we're always telling the kids. Yeah, and is, is that because we're watching them every time? But it, it is an interesting question, and, and yeah. it's, it's, it's quantifiable. There, there are, the numbers are there somewhere. Yeah, yeah. So if we can get around to that, or maybe somebody out there yeah. watching could get to it because my lazy ass might not. I'm not watching all those games. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I'd be curious though. I would. I'd be curious if others, those other big one time guys, missed the net uh, as much. But again, the good news is they didn't have to rely on those big boys if you know just to to get this victory. So the guy that did come through for him that uh, we touched on again pre and post, and it's going to get into right now, is Jake DeBrusque and the way that uh, he was able to, uh, I think, accelerate his game in the second and third period to where more noticeable. First period he was in on, but not enough. I mean, he, he, he just didn't have enough. You made the observation about his stick not being in a good spot in the first period, and yet second and third period it was. So, you know, extrapolate on that more. So the listeners, if they didn't get a chance to hear our intermissions or listen post game. 
it just from the sports deck noticing he was getting in on the four check in the first period, but he was going into the corner, two hands on his stick, stick up in the air, and he was trying to get the stick on the body and steer the person, steer one of the defenders with the body with the stick, rather than stick on puck, maybe causing a little bit of cr- havoc causing a turnover, having a puck go off a stick and go in front. And also, you don't have to get as close to the defender if your stick's out in front of you, stick on puck. You have mm-hmm. a, you get you get to get on that guy a split second earlier. So, um, and, and the perfect example of that was on the goal. He's in on it first. He gets his stick on the puck and or the defender's stick, and that causes the turnover. And then he goes to the front of the net. The puck ends up. At the net, of course, because that's where it goes, and the good players, and the, the, the that's why they go there. Mm-hmm. Um, so, so again, those are teaching points. I, I I got to imagine the coach. If I noticed it from, you know, three hundred feet away, the coaching staff's going to notice it, and they can break that down. And I, I think it just adds an element to uh, playing tougher, playing being harder to play against. And that's what Brad Marchand and Patrice Bergeron do amazingly well. There's mm-hmm. sticks on the ice. There's sticks on the puck. All of the time. Yeah. It's such an important lesson. It is. And it's such a good mm-hmm. habit thing. St- stick to puck. Bob Hartley, when I was with the Atlanta Thrashers organization, would it was almost sounded like a hockey camp, you know, when he was teaching to 12-year-olds. And uh, there's a joke there that the Atlanta Thrashers early on kind of played like that, but I'm not going to go there because I have too much respect for those guys. Um, but when it was tough at times, though. and Bob Hartley <laughs> treated Patrick Wall and Joe Sackett like 12 year olds, too. So he, he treated everyone like a 12 year old. He did, he used to stick to Buck. Hey, Big Billy, he would call me hey, Big Billy. Let's go. We used to play three on three post morning skates. Uh, he was actually pretty good at that, but uh, he thought he was Sergey Zuba, his favorite player, yeah, yeah, time. yeah. Um, oh, but all right, so but but Jake scores a huge goal. You could see the euphoria in his reaction. The crowd embraced him. First of all, they gave him a nice uh warm ovation, you know, welcome at the beginning of the game. But then they they really gave him a nice ovation when he scored that goal. And Jake is a he's a likable kid, you, you know. Um we did discuss that, you know. COVID, isolation, uh, separation. Separation, I think, is the big thing. Really played with his mind a bit. He talked about that uh, last year, too. And now let's hope that playing with two veteran players, not that he didn't have veteran players before with him, but this is, I mean, you've got a former captain on his line. You've got big brother over there, right? You know, he's, he's he's not his dad. Nick Felino, I'm talking about, but he could be his uncle. You know what I mean? It's it's Uncle Nick, mm-hmm. you know, some type of thing. Yeah. And 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 Felino, who's had some nice numbers in his career earlier, I think can 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 shed some light for Jake DeBrus, can lead him, you know, into the right direction. And then Howell out physically, I think, with his speed, can force him into a good place. It's gonna take time, don't get me wrong. But the first game. Nice results, uh, especially as the game went on. To me, they got more noticeable as the game went on. I agree. Yeah, especially that third line did definitely. And mm-hmm. and and just quickly, the the Felino, you talk about leadership on the bottom six. Patrice Bergeron's got to deal with it. He's the leader. He's the the CEO. But mm-hmm. you still need guys underneath to to pass that along. And that's a perfect point, Felino. Being able to stay on Jake DeBrusque and being able to to continually keep him going throughout games, even if they have a bad shift or a bad play, we're going to keep going. And that's something that Patrice Bergeron can't do on the bench because he's on the ice 20, 22 right. minutes a night. Right. He's out there playing his own game. That's where those those guys that are on the, the third, fourth lines, leadership guys, are a big deal on the bench. Because the big players are out on the ice. The bench guys are there. They can keep the bench light. They can keep them active and engaged. And I think that will be a good asset for Jake, having him on the line. Uncle Nick. Yeah, Uncle Nick doesn't need to, you know, of course he wants to score. But he's done his scoring in his career. He's now, he's there to win as a Bruin. And he's there to help a young player mature his game to the full, you know, max. To get him... To, to, mm-hmm. to get him to a consistency level that, you know, Nick Felino can, can look over to Jake 
and say, get your ass going. You know, yep. get your ass. And, and Charlie Coyle, when he played with Jake, I don't know if Charlie, because his age, he's not that much older than Jake. He's a couple of years. He has more experience in the league. But, you know, but, but also the success that Felino's had with regard to it has been, yeah. you know, there's that respect factor. So I think it's a good mix. I think the Howla impact has been good. You know, Howla was 9 of 15 on the faceoffs in the first game. He played 15 minutes. He killed penalties. Um, I think he's got enough time in the league. What is he? This is his fifth team, I believe, maybe sixth, fifth team for sure. I, I think his cachet. Uh, it's different than Nick Foligno. Nick Foligno was a captain for years. Yeah. Howler, though, is going to be – Howler's a confident kid, so he's not going to hold back, I don't think, with yeah, yeah. Jake either. And he's got a lot to prove, similar mm -hmm. to Jake. Nick Foligno doesn't have much to prove. You know, he right. wants to win, but he doesn't really have much. But Howler scored a lot of points a few years ago. He was on a big trajectory, and he's taken a step back. And he has a lot to prove here, and he has an opportunity here that he recognizes, but he's going to need Jake DeBrusque to help him yeah, get exactly. to that expectation as well. They need both. They need each other. So it, it, it seems to be a good fit. And I liked it in the regular, in the preseason and uh, excited for them to be able to get the game winner tonight. Uh, what do we talk about the fourth line? What do we, uh, what, you know, because I, I'm, I'm not trying to be, um, I won't be negative. It's game one for crying out loud. It's game one. Yep. But but let's be real. Let's not BS. We don't do that here on Morning Brew. Um, for I didn't think that they were very impactful for two periods. I I, I just I just didn't. Uh, and I'm yeah, I think time, you know, through, through. I like No Six still. I, I think he made some plays on his own, uh, but the wingers were certainly uh, much too quiet to be able to end. And you could see there, you know, there was certainly some frustration from Bruce Cassidy. Um, mm -hmm. They were out there uh, in the last four minutes when they had too many men on the ice on the delayed penalty. Frederick mm -hmm. was out there and yet got a few words in his ears on the way over from the play during that shift. And so, so I think it was, you know, and, and Kuhlman is, he skates hard, he plays hard, but he, he misses the net all the time. And it, it just, it, it but so, so they need to be better, and, and those are the two guys that are the opportune. They need they're they're fighting for their lives. And yeah, so they, they have to they, be right. They need to be better. Yeah, I, I wonder what the amount of games will be. Yeah, what their leash is. Yeah, can't see, be long. Well, but you only have one player right now up here that is right now. Anton Bleed is pushing Trent Frederick. Mm -hmm. Okay, Chris Wagner is down in the American League. Uh, he could be called up though, right? Like mm -hmm. they're not, they made it clear they're not going to bring Stanika and no. play him on the right wing. I, I'm not trying to get anybody sad after one game, but it's just let's reality. Now they they each played their most time per in the game in the third period, yeah. so they did a little bit more. Right? I think they had about four or five shifts each in the third. Nosek ended up having five shifts in the third for three minutes and thirty nine seconds. He played a total of twelve minutes in this game. And he was the most noticeable of them. But he's going to have a hard time very soon doing it on his own. So I'm rooting for both. Want to see him in, get more involved. It's not about the first hit for Trent Frederick. It's the second and third hit to keep offensive thrust alive or to win three battles to get the puck out of the zone. For Kuhlman, it has to be about not just, you know, uh, as I called him, the, the the puck hunter a few years ago. You can't just hunt pucks. You now got to do something with it, and you got to be. He's not mm -hmm. huge, but Wagner's not big, and Wagner was much more physical. So I, I I would say if there was one thing that was like a all right, but moment in that game, it was that. It was it was it was the play of that. Speaking of that, too many men on the ice. <laughs> Have you had that before when you were playing? I, I I have seen it, but I can't remember exactly when. But I've it, I, I've seen it more often where the goalie gets close to the bench or a guy jumps as the goalie's you know twenty feet away rather than they always do is blow the play dead and they then. blow it dead. Yes, exactly. I, I don't recall ever having that big of a mix up. And that listen that that also goes to the rookie goaltender a little bit because he came out halfway, then he decided to stay back. 
uh, forwards aren't necessarily smart enough all the time to, to hold back and recognize that. Mm -hmm. Um, so, so it was, it was also on, that was a little bit on Swayman, um, yeah, I agree. at the, at the NHL level, typically I, I know what he's doing. He's staying in the net just in case a D man bobbles a puck and it goes in the net, but the NHL level get to the bench, get out of the way. No one's going to put it in their own net. Or if they uh, do, maybe, yeah, yeah, they do, that's then... not on you. That's just, right. just not on you. Get to the bench, get out of the way. College hockey, you might think about staying back just in case and, and holding on because no one can make a play. But the NHL mm -hmm. level, someone can make a play 200 feet really, really quickly. Um, and, and that extra man's pretty beneficial. So I, I thought that was just not on, not completely on him, but just as much as anyone else. It was, it was swaying and getting over there and getting out of the way. Yeah. Have you ever, did you ever have a goal scored on you when you uh, exited no. the net? Never. No, 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 no. I never. I don't think I've ever. I didn't see that either. That that's pretty rare. Again, it, it it's is really. It's really rare. I've seen it uh, at, but very infrequent at the NHL level. Yeah. Um. So, who do we think starts in goal Wednesday night in Philly? The Bruins go now four days. They have Sunday off, a full day off, which everybody will appreciate. It's here in the New England area. It's supposed to be fall weather, meaning. Not beautiful fall weather like we've had uh, the last couple of a week or so, but it's supposed to be rainy and cool and damp and yeah. fall. Um, but then they have Monday so, and Tuesday practice and then a game Thursday in Philadelphia. Who do you think they go back with? They go or go with Jeremy Swayman or do they go with Linus Olmark? Well, so for me, the question is, do they want Linus Allmark playing against his newly old team, the Buffalo mm -hmm. Sabres, on Friday night? And there is some players, coaches that – and Yarrow Halak didn't want to play against Washington. Exactly. Recall, he didn't want to play against Islanders. Um, goalies, some go – and and I had coaches that wouldn't let me play against my former teams. Um mm -hmm. Just mm -hmm. because of the extra ness that comes into that, and and certainly being on a team four months ago and switching out that you were there for a while, that can add more stress. And I, I get it; Buffalo stinks, and they should win anyways, no matter who's in net. Um, but it'll that basically that I'm sure it's been scheduled out, and I'm sure the decision was around whether we want our goalie Allmark playing against his former team right away. If they have no problem with that, Allmark plays Friday against his former team. Some coaches like their guy playing against their former team. They think they add something to it. If they all think that way, Allmark plays Friday. If they don't, then I think you have to play him on Wednesday in Philadelphia. Yeah, um, I think Philly's a good team. Uh, they've got a few injuries there. Ristolainen is still out. They're trying to figure it out. They, they had a, a game against Vancouver. Uh, the other night where they were down and then they end up coming back, they get a point, they lose in a shootout. Um, I don't have Philly's schedule in front of me, but, but I'm assuming they'll play between you know now and then, so went, then being Wednesday night. Um, I, I'm i going to think that they go back with Swayman. I, I, I'm going to think that they do. Uh, put him in there, especially if Carter Hart's playing, the other young gun goaltender who's struggled mightily at times last year, Razor, and um, – he was inconsistent in, in game one against the uh, Vancouver Canucks. Um, I, I think I, I just think they go back with Jeremy, and then I think they say to Linus, look, Linus, you're going to work hard and practice these few days. You know, he's – I think Linus Olmark is learning about what it is to be a Bruin, the work ethic of guys like Marchand Bergeron, uh, McAvoy, uh, and – you know, I think they're going to work with him a few more days, and they're going to say, all right, now we got you against Buffalo. Now, look, if he rocks and rolls, if he does it great against Buff, then you can play him Sunday at home, give him that matinee against San Jose. Uh, that's my guess. That's all it is, is a guess. But Swain and I would think we'll get, we'll get Wednesday based on his performance on Saturday night. Yeah, and I, it, that would be fine. Um, played well and uh, as usual. Uh, so, so you keep rolling, and, and if you would look at it, Philly could be a team that you're fighting a playoff spot for. You have to think that way as well this year, sure. differently than 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 last season. Yeah, in the small seat, it was it, you do have to think big picture and different divisions and yeah. all those things. So, yeah, 
and take I your think, points when you can. You got to bank them when you can. It's all yeah, about the NHL. You bank points as much as you can, especially when you don't play a lot early on. You know, because mm-hmm. the games are going to come fast and furious eventually for the Bruins, and, and uh, it's a bit of a mentality, right? You you you're already you're chasing teams, mm-hmm. and, and yes, you've only played one game, but you aren't at the top of the division when you open up the the internet tomorrow morning. You're you're in the middle of the pack, even with a one win. When you open up the internet, Jesus, that's an old man, right? <laughs> oh, I was going to say open up the newspaper and then the internet. And then what else do you find the standings? I don't know. We get the, Anywhere. We get the... <laughs> everywhere. That's where you find the standings. Open up the internet. Holy Seriously, shit. Who are, everywhere. Who are, you me? are you me for crying out loud? <laughs> oh, my God. Oh, my God. Um, uh... <laughs> quickly here now before we wrap this one up. We didn't touch on the Charlie McAvoy signing because we I don't think we didn't have a show, right? Am I forgetting? Or no, he right. signed in between. No, it just happened yesterday, right? Uh, yeah, it seems like a month ago, but it just it happened. does. So I don't know. Truthfully, I don't know how much there is to talk about it, if only because yeah, we knew, we, we we knew what he was going to get. We had talked yep. about his nine to nine and a half. They go to the nine and a half because he said, "Okay, if I'm going to go eight years." It's not going to be 9.2, 9.25. It's going to be nine and a half. It's, it's going to be that. Mm-hmm. Um, it's a good signing for both sides. Um, I happen to think, as we sit here and, and talk, Razor, that he is better than Seth Jones, uh, you know, who got 9.5. He's better than Darnell Nurse, who better got 9.25. I think he is better than Wierenski right now. Now, that could be something about team bias, meaning one's really not great in Columbus and one is better in Boston. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think Wierenski is a pretty good defenseman. I, I do. Offensively, he's, you know, really yeah. good in that regard. But they paid him all that money basically to stay in Columbus so he wouldn't leave and go somewhere. Uh, we saw Miro Heiskin in on Saturday night. He's an excellent young defenseman, different than Charlie. but. Um, and yeah. I mean, look, Charlie. Charlie said, "Okay, I'm. You know, you know, Kale McCarr is a guy that he's going to get the big comps to right now. Kale signed for nine million, but he only wanted six years. So he got six years from from Colorado because now he's going to get the free agency sooner. You know, and then he could be at thirteen million by then or whatever if he continues to trend upwards. But yeah. I, I'm thrilled for both sides that they got that deal done." Yeah, it's a it's a great it is a bit of a non story, I think, right. even though it's a huge deal, most in Bruins history. Um, mm-hmm. but he got what he deserved. He got market value. The Bruins got market value for their best defenseman. Uh they got him for eight years. There was nothing ever contentious, and that no one ever said that it wasn't gonna get done or they had a bad week of negotiating. Right. They're way ahead of this. They got it. So so yeah, to your point of um, it, it's just a really good signing. Just the Bruins are doing good business. They're, that's yeah. the real, they're doing very good business and they're being fair with their guys. And they seem to have figured out a way to, to avoid headaches, like what's happening with a, 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 a Jack Eichel, for instance, yeah. which is a worst case scenario, but, but they're, they're, they're doing a really nice job of uh, being fair with their young guys, yeah. important well, guys. They're trying to build the next core, the next generation. Um, mm-hmm. And they have some of it. They have a, they definitely have it now with defense with Carlo and McAvoy. There's no question about that. Now we know they got Pasternak uh, up front. And maybe Swimman. And maybe Swimman, right. So then you got pretty, good, pretty good building block. All right, so that's going to wrap this morning brew with Jaffe and Razor up as the Bruins skate to a 3-1 victory on Saturday night at TD Garden, the home opener for the 21 21- 22 NHL season, a season, folks, that we sure as hell hope is the full 82. Give us the full Monty, man, of 82. Oh, yeah. um, everybody, please stay safe and healthy in the NHL, and not just the NHL, everywhere around. Uh, and then get us to that mark, and, and and hopefully we get through all this, and the NHL has what we what we call a, a, a normal season. So uh, this is, again, our first episode as a partner along with the great people over at Nesson where Razor and I work. So, again, we are thrilled to be partnering with them. We are available through Nesson.com, but also on all of the places and more 
where you get your podcasts. Well, more than we used to send them to. So you're, it's not going to change a thing. You're going to continue to get your podcast dropped when the new episode is out there. But now, people, you can find us through Nesson.com. They've got a lot of great stuff on that website, too. So uh, we really thank them for, for coming together and, and, and making the partnership happen. It's good stuff. We love the ads. And we love it so much. They went from a solid ad, what I would call, in second intermission to, I mean, the big buck ad in, in post game. Mm-hmm. I mean, that was the big buck ad right there. We saw our name in lights, so to speak. Uh, there was a... Uh, uh... A proud moment, proud yes. moment to see that coffee <laughs> mug and bright lights. We love it. And what we will do, we will let you know. We will let you know. Nesson will let you know when new episodes are coming out. We're putting together a schedule. It's going to be on average two times a week. It's not going to be after every single game. We explained this before, but we'll do it again right now just because we can't do it after every single Bruin game due to schedules around, but we're giving you a couple of these shows a week. We're going to cover things. We're going to have fun. We're taking your questions. Everything that makes Morning Brew with Jaffe and Razor great, we're going to continue to do that. But again, that'll wrap this episode up. Everybody have a wonderful time enjoying the Bruin season opening victory. I think you've deserved a second cup and enjoy your coffees, plural. <laughs>